we can see you down here today. Let's pray. We have a lot to cover tonight. So we're going to, uh, Coral, keep up with me, okay? <laughs> I know you can. I know you can. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today and just always the, the thrill and, and excitement to be a part of your kingdom, to be a part of your church family, to worship together as a family. Uh, we just thank you for those opportunities. We look forward to them every week, and I pray that we are faithful throughout the week as your witnesses, as people who are to shine your light into this dark world. May we learn about that tonight and uh, be encouraged by our part and our role in the bringing together of heaven and earth. And God, we uh, lift up this class to you and thank you for all that you do. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay. Tonight we're going to have to sprint. Let's say that. Sprint to a, a fast run, but not quite a jog. That's too, that's too slow. So we're going to do some running tonight um, through chapters 11, 10 and 11. And just to get us caught up to where we are, we just finished a section that I call the second exodus. All the plagues, just like in Pharaoh's day that God brings on the earth as he brings about his final judgments, um, will be likened to those plagues in the sense of he will judge the earth as he did Pharaoh but in much more apocalyptic nature, meaning it was exaggerated, it was bigger, it was larger than life. Uh, demon locusts, not just locusts. And we saw all those things leading up to the seventh trumpet, the, the call to repentance. But we're not quite to the seventh trumpet because as with the seven seals, we have an interlude. And chapter 7 was the interlude. 144,000 are protected from uh, the judgment of God. They're sealed from God's judgment. And then the seventh seal opened up the seven trumpets. We've gone through the six trumpets. And, and all six of them resonate with this Exodus language, this plague language that God brings upon his enemy to rescue and redeem his people. But we haven't got quite to the seventh trumpet, though we will get there tonight. We have to have another interlude. And as I said before, interludes kind of give us a pause in the action, but they also provide for us a word to the church, a word for the church to hear, almost like a sermon from God, if you will. Here's what I need to say to you. Here's what I need you to hear. Here's how I can encourage you. Here's how I need to challenge you as a church. And this one is rich. Uh, you think of the richest thing you ate over Thanksgiving break. Maybe it was a pie. Maybe it was the dressing Maybe it was whatever your turkey was basted in. Was it good? Everybody enjoy it? This is a rich layer of a lot of somethings, okay? Chapters 10 and 11, very rich, rich with imagery. Um, a lot clearer for me to kind of walk through with you. It's, it's some of my favorite parts of Revelation because of what's here. So let's begin with chapter 10. It reads like this, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Then the angel I had seen standing on the, land, on the scene on the land raised his right hand to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. 
So I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. And then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. That's just a short chapter (laughs) in all this. All right, what's going on with John? Let's go back to the very beginning with the mighty angel, a description of the mighty angel, uh, robed in a cloud with a rainbow, face like the sun, legs like fiery pillars. Really, if you go back to chapter 4 and start reading about the description of the one who sits on the throne, God himself, you get similar language to this language. And so obviously, if this isn't God that he's describing, it is a messenger from God. It's trying to let us know this is from God. This is God's voice speaking. And even the fiery pillars could remind us of the pillars that Israel followed by night in the desert, that God's presence was indeed there. So these are images, if you will, of God's very presence. And if you mark down this as an Old Testament reference, Amos chapter 3, verse 8, Amos chapter 3, verse 8, a reference to the voice of God sounding like a lion, the roar of a lion. And that's what happens here with this angel. As he shouted, it was like the roar of a lion. And so you have this angelic, God-like angel that comes down to bring a message to John from heaven images that surround this angel are images of god and his presence and so it's obvious we're talking about his presence here and so god's presence in the in maybe as a messenger an angel coming to john holding out a little scroll planting his foot on the sea and on the land it shows a sovereignty over the whole earth that God, you know, firmly, this is his footstool, hasn't we heard God talk about that in the Old Testament? The earth is my footstool. And so this is his footstool. He is sovereign, reigns supreme over all the earth. And so that's just that image of the angel. And so it's loaded. That image is completely loaded with images of the presence of God. So we're clear that we're talking about God and his presence coming to John through the form of an angel, giving him this message, this little scroll. Well, we'll get to the little scroll in just a minute. When he shouts, the voices of the seven thunders speak, and when they spoke, John says, I was about to write it down, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal it up and do not write it down. Oh, that is frustrating. (laughs) You want to know what the seven thunders are, don't you? So do I. (laughs) And nobody knows. God's done this before. At the end of Daniel, he he gives a message to Daniel and and something that Daniel saw or something that Daniel heard, and he tells him, seal it up. It's not time. Seal it up. So what do we make of this? We have seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls are coming, the seven churches, and I have... My, my messenger, who looks angelic. Thank you very much. I forgot a book at home. Now I know I'm in my 40s because I do this all the time now. Needed something for tonight. My dear wife, you can thank her later for taking an extra trip out here tonight. So here's the seven thunders. <clears throat> Anybody watch the movie A Few Good Men? Mm-hmm. And Jack Nicholson's on the, on the witness stand? And uh, Tom Cruise is pushing and pushing and pushing for the red. Code red, code red, code red. He wants to get that out of him. He says, I want the truth. And what does Nicholas say next? You can't handle the truth. Yeah, you guys are with me. (laughs) That's how I think of the seven thunders. We know thunder kind of represents, well, it does, kind of, but it represents the voice of God. His, His voice thunders. That happens a lot through Scripture. Jesus is baptized. The, the angel comes, uh, the dove comes down. God speaks. Some heard, this is my one and only son, but others heard thunder. God speaks to Paul, drops him blind on the road to Damascus. Some heard, but some hear thunder. Sometimes people hear thunder because God's voice is like thunder, just like Mount Sinai. He comes down the mountain, his presence is like thunder. We've had thunder around the throne peals of thunder and rumblings and lightning and so you have power imagery we know that the seven thunders are the very voice of god 
okay? And whatever it was that he wanted to reveal to John at that time was seven. What does seven mean in Revelation? Complete and whole. So the complete, if you will, voice of God, the whole will of God, everything God, well, he, it's, it's like knowing who killed JFK, you know? <laughs> Only a few people know such secrets. God, I think, revealed his complete voice to John. And John was like going, oh, oh boy, this is good stuff. This is everything. And then he says, Dot, seal it up. Don't write it down. You know, there are some things about the sovereignty of God. There are some things about God's vast, complete knowledge, complete will, that if you really knew you couldn't handle it, you can't handle the truth, <laughs> the whole truth. I mean, what if you had the same same viewpoint that God had on this world? Could you live with the fact that some well, some people are saved from tragedy and some aren't? And that you know, his complete and com vast knowledge of all circumstances, why he intervenes, why he doesn't intervene, why he does what he does, why he doesn't do what he doesn't do, to have all that knowledge in your head and to live with that? I don't think I can handle the truth. I think that's the point here, is that the seven thunders ring out the voice of God, the very will of God to John, and he says, nope, I'm not going to let that cat out of the bag. That's too much, but John maybe needs at this point in the revelation, he needs to have perspective. Maybe he needs to have a little God-like perspective to keep going. This is pr At this point in time, would this not be wearing you out? <laughs> you're at Patmos, and you're writing down. And in fact, after we just got done with chapters 8 and 9, and all the plagues and all the nastiness that we saw there, and the images there, just very overwhelming, and John must be overwhelmed, and then God plants this on him, maybe so that he can see why, how it all makes sense. Because we've been talking about seals and trumpets. We've been talking about God's redemptive will and God's call to repentance. And how does all of that and, and the allowance of evil to rise up, to do its worst, how does that fit in with the sovereignty of God? You know, that's tough stuff, isn't it? How do you wrap your brain around that? I think the point of the seven thunders is we can't. We can't wrap our brain around that. You know, some things that you tell your children because they can handle it, and some things you're like, you know, son, daughter, don't worry about it. You don't need to know about that right now. But dad, I want, no, you can't handle that right now. You, you, just, you just need to trust mom and dad on this one. And we get to that point with our children even, you know, sometimes the older they get, the more we may reveal to them, but... Boy, my dad didn't reveal everything about his childhood to me until the last five to ten years. Well, my 30s. Because it wasn't that pretty. And so, some things you just got to hold tight to the vest. And I think God may be giving John some perspective, but he certainly doesn't think the rest of the world is ready for that same perspective with the seven thunders. Now, could I be wrong about this? Maybe, yeah, I think I could, because this is so mysterious, I don't know that we have an exact answer on the seven thunders. But we know thunder equals God's voice, we know seven equals whole, the complete voice of God being revealed. Boy, that's a lot. That's just a lot. And so, kind of think of it that way. It's one of the probably bigger mysteries of the whole book of Revelation. People have always wondered, what are the seven thunders? I, I don't know exactly, but I, I, I give that as a, as a good, educated Yes, but I think a pretty educated one. All right, we'll kind of move on. And the angel I saw standing on the sea in the land raised his right hand. Right hand is the hand of power in Jewish uh, literature, in Jewish thinking. It's the right hand, the power hand, the authority hand. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever. And we talk about the God who creates the heavens, the earth, and the sea. And he says, here's an interesting phrase, there will be no more delay. For those looking for this incredible timeline and trying to chart out Revelation are going to be very disappointed by the fact that in, at this point, before we get to the final trumpet, he doesn't say, oh, there's going to be this and then that and then this thousand years and then this and then that. The tribulation and all these other things that we kind of 
add on to it. He says, no, there is no more delay. The time has come. In fact, he says, no more delay. In the days when the seventh angel is about to sing his trumpet, the mystery of God will be, what is the word? Be accomplished. It will be done. We're not looking to chart this thing out into the future. He says when this takes place, it's done. When God brings his judgment, it's over. There's no timelines to follow. There's no signs to look for. This is done. Just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. And so, you you have all of that, and then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Take the scroll that lies in the hand, who is sitting on the sea and the land. So he took it, and he was told to take and eat. It turns your stomach, stomach, this is a small chiasm, real real tiny chiasm, by the way. You know, the angel tells him, it'll turn your uh, stomach sour, but then it'll be sweet in your mouth. And then when John eats the scroll, he says the opposite. Well, it was sweet in my mouth, and then it was sour to my stomach. So a tiny little key as some. That's kind of fun, but, you know, just want to throw that out there to, to, to say what's the point. The point is that really the little scroll, the will of God, the, the God's redemptive plan, is sweet. It is very sweet. Salvation is a good, good thing, but it has a sour element to it. We're not talking about sweet and sour sauce here either, you know. I know some of you may like that. I like sweet and sour sauce. No, it's sweet, but sour is bitter in the stomach, meaning judgment is on the other side of the sword. Judgment's on the other side of truth, as well as salvation. On one side, there's judgment. And so there's the sweetness of Man, it's great when you see somebody come to Jesus Christ and they're baptized into Christ, and that is sweet. Nothing better. I would cancel all sermons. I'd do anything to have that just going on all the time. That would be awesome. But there's the sour part of it. And the sour part is that we, you know, people that have died outside of Christ? Is it that hard? I do. Close to my family, I know. And it's tough. And it's sour. It does make you feel sick when you think about it. When those times come, it's just like, man, wish that hadn't happened. Wish they knew the Lord. Wish they were in good relationship with Jesus. I wish, I wish. So you have that double-edged sword, and that's what he does when he takes the message. And he, another thing about the message is this, that um, God wants us to completely ingest, if you will, take in the total message. Eat the scroll. You know, take the word of God, the will of God, everything about it. Take this and just pour it in. He doesn't say nibble on it, you know, and then put it down and have leftovers later. <laughs> leftovers, that's the word for the week. He doesn't say take a little bite and leave it and, and don't come back to it. He says eat it. You ever eat something you know is going to make your stomach sour? You you know ahead of time it's going to, and you eat it anyway? Tastes good going down, yeah. <laughs> he wants you to eat the entire message. He wants you to embody the entire message of God. So eat the scroll. John, as a prophet, as one who preached, he was told, you must now prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. You are to take this message to the entire world. The interlude begins with John. It's interesting that John now is inserted into the story as a, as a key character. He's one that has not only seen the vision and writing it down, but now he's participating in it. Now God is asking him to do, asking him to witness. And so the interlude here is the interlude of witnessing. Um, let's go back to the trumpets. So the seven trumpets are all about a call to repentance. As we've seen through the Pharaoh Exodus story and the plagues, the first six kind of talk about those plagues. The hope is the interlude before we get to number seven. The hope within all of this that God brings and bubbles to the surface for us is that there is hope within this call to repentance. It's not all gloom and doom. It's not all demon locusts. It's not all judgment language. In the midst of all of this judgment that God will bring on evil, he will do it. In the middle of that is this interlude. And that interlude is a call for God's people to be a part of this repentance project called witnessing. That's the message to the church, that we are to be his 
witnesses. We are to be his witnesses. We are to share good news with the entire world, even if it means suffering. Before we jump into chapter 11, this is what my dear wife brought to me. I want to give you some comparison here between chapter 10 in Revelation and Daniel chapter 12. So let's put a little comparison on here. Just to show that, that, that John is working from a, a template. Let's say. He's working from an Old Testament template. And, and as he's working from that, you can see images that tie in with the Old Testament. So in Daniel chapter 12... Similar images appear. Daniel 12, verse 6, it says, The angel was located above the waters of the river. In, in Revelation 10, 2, the angel straddles the land and the sea. And so we'll put Daniel 12 up here. And let's put uh, Revelation 10. So the first thing we learn in Daniel 12, verse 6, is the angel uh, straddles the waters. In, in Revelation 10, the angel has a foot in the sea. More comparisons. It says, the angel predicts the final events of time from the labor pains, that is, this time of, uh, that we're in now, the church age, through the resurrection and final judgment on to the consummation of God's kingdom. The first three verses talk about the final, in, in Daniel 12, the final consummation of all things. Consummation. Yeah, I got to go back and spell things out. Then you have throughout Revelation 10, several verses, verses 2, 8, 9, 10, and 11, the angel holds the little scroll and it contains the prophecies, the, the, the message of the end. And so the end is in the scroll. No more delay. God's will, his mystery will be accomplished, it will be done couple more uh, comparisons. The angel commands Daniel to seal up the prophecy and hide it until um, the end of time. And so in verse 4 in Daniel 12, hide this prophecy. Now in Revelation 10, a couple of things happen. One, the angel is, is commanding John to eat the scroll so that he can prophesy. So you have prophecy happening. Go and reveal instead of conceal. So this one's conceal. This one's reveal. But there's also that element we just talked about of concealing everything in the seven thunders. So you have hiding the prophecy, concealing it, revealing it through eating the scroll and prophesying to many people. But you also have the concept of concealing seven thunders and hiding the prophecy in Daniel. So even Daniel's told, you can't, you can't let the whole cat out of the bag here. You can't let everything out right now. And the final comparison here, uh, Daniel asks the question, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? And the angel raises his hand toward heaven, swears by the God who lives forever that the fulfillment will be delayed. It will take place in the future. After a time, times and half a time have passed. That's what he says in Daniel 6 and 7. So there is a delay on things that are going to happen. It's going to be future, and we'll get back to this in a couple weeks. Uh, time, times, and half time. Oh boy, what's that all about? A period of time. Let's just leave it at that. We'll get back to it uh, next week. Here, um, well, we'll actually talk about it a little bit tonight. We'll talk about time, time, half time. Here it says, do not delay. There is no more delay. No more delay. Let the finale happen. So these are just comparisons between two chapters in our Bible. But it, what it needs to point out to us is that this message is not just given in a, in a black hole somewhere. He's just not, just not uh, just throwing stuff out there. It, is, it has a template. It has a formation already laid down back in the Old Testament. And so between Daniel 12, things have kind of shifted. It's gone from some similar images to 
Well, some things that are concealed to things that are revealed, some things that are in delay, some things that are not in delay. And so we're moving forward here in history, if you will. And those comparisons are very important for us to catch um, so we know the message is totally from God as it had been for centuries and centuries. It's amazing that Daniel, I mean, when's Daniel written? Way back, 500s B.C. And this is, so it's almost about 600 years apart, these revelations of God to his messengers, Daniel and John. And yet a similar message comes out. It really helps us hold the Bible together in a, in a very beautiful and unique way as well. And, you know, if anybody comes and says, how do you believe your Bible's true and real? <laughs> Stuff like this convinces me all the time. I mean, we can't hardly in 200 years of American history get our facts straight when it comes to history, can we? You figure all that out, how do we interpret the Constitution? We can't do that very well. But the Bible holds together so well, I believe. it. Just, and this is just one little piece of the whole puzzle. All right, moving on to chapter 11. Our part, as John's part, comes into play. John's part is to take the scroll, eat it, and prophesy. Speak about, the, not just take in the message, but speak about the message. Say something about the message. Well, guess what? We're going to now be a part of this redemptive um, witnessing in chapter 11. And it's loaded. Here we go. Chapter 11. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Okay, we'll stop there. And that's enough right there. Told you this is like decadent desserts, <laughs> rich steak. You know, we're, we're, we're getting ourselves into some good stuff here. What is this temple measuring? I was given a reed to measure the temple, measure the worshipers, the altar, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure the outer court. I wish I could draw this to scale. I wish I could draw it at all, but I won't. Let me just tell you about the temple, the Old Testament temple. The Old Testament temple had the, um, the, the inner court. It would be where um, the priests could go. It had an outer court where the men could go. And an outer, outer court where the women could go. But all this was part of what they would call the inner court. Because they were all Jews. Jewish priests, Jewish men, Jewish women. Then there's a court outside of all that. It's the outer court. And they call it, It's where the Gentiles could gather. Okay? That's just a basic overview of the temple in the Old Testament, okay? There's the insiders. There's the outsiders. In, out. Okay, trying to make it very simple. Insiders, outsiders. Those are in, those are out. He's told to measure. Measure this, he's told. Measure this. What's he trying to tell him in this? You measure that, uh, but don't measure the outer court. Don't measure this. Because they're outside. They're outside of the covenant of God. Those who belong to the covenant are Jews. Those who don't are outside of that. And so don't measure this, measure that. This is similar language, and write these texts down and go back and read this. Uh, God told Ezekiel to do similar things. From Ezekiel chapter 40 through Ezekiel chapter 43, goes through a long, detailed list of how to measure and measure out the, the various dimensions of the temple. Okay, Inside and out. Insider's court, outsider's court. Also, Zechariah chapter 2. 
Zechariah chapter 2 is, is the language of measuring the temple. Who's on the inside, who's on the outside. What this image really is trying to portray to us is not so much you know, a detailed account of what the temple looked like. It was trying to communicate to us who's in the covenant of God and who's out of the covenant of God. It's just like in chapter 7. Seal up those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Seal up those who are wearing the white robes. Seal up those who belong to me, the 144,000. Same kind of interlude. Let's figure out who's in, who's out. And so John is called about to, to measure those who are in and those who are out. And he describes those who are out. They, will, they are the Gentiles who trample on the holy city. They don't care about God's covenant. They trample on the holy city. You know, the holy city from Old Testament is Jerusalem, where the temple would be. So all this, again, is imagery, not literally Jerusalem, not literally the temple, because in AD 95-96, there is no temple in Jerusalem. It got flattened in AD 70. So there's no temple there. So they're not thinking about going back to Jerusalem. They're not thinking about rebuilding a temple. They're thinking about what does this symbolize? We're in symbols. It symbolizes the people who belong to his covenant and those who don't belong to his covenant. Those who are a part of this Jesus Christ movement and those who are not part of the Jesus Christ movement. And he talks about it in terms of Jewish language. Insiders, outsiders. In the temple, outside the temple. And so catch that language as he goes along, and he talks about them doing this for 42 months. Well, give me the end of this, this whole thing to get you into the 42 months, the time, time, half a time, the 1,260 days, the three and a half days. The, we got a lot there to unpack, but just, just hold that in your mind as, as just a, a symbol of a short, incomplete period of time. Think of it as the time of the church church age that we're in the time of tribulation the time that we currently live in today we'll stop on that and get back to that in, in a little bit notice that these these are two witnesses two witnesses um in deuteronomy 19 deuteronomy 19 15 part of the law was to say if anybody wants to establish something as the truth they need two or three witnesses right at least two witnesses to establish the truth about anything and so uncommon here for him to say i have my two witnesses that i'm giving power to they will preach prophesy proclaim for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth what does sackcloth represent mourning witnessing is a sour to the stomach event <laughs> because sometimes it means well what americans never want christians to do and that is make a judgment call <laughs> to judge something as wrong you ever get in trouble for saying something is wrong that's wrong oh you're just intolerant <laughs> that's the world we live in sackcloth would show that image of mourning sadness because they know as they go out, as God's witnesses go out, they will be trampled on. It's a sure thing. It's not a sure thing that you're going to go out and walk in the tulips and walk in the rose garden and, and say, you love Jesus? And everybody that walks by says, yes, I do. Tell me more about it. <laughs> you want to live right and turn your life around? Yes, I do. Tell me more. You don't get that response often. A lot of pushback because we love our own selves too much. We love our own lifestyles too much. And so to call me to repentance, to call me to change my life, it's, it's a hard thing. In John's day, it was a hard thing. In Jesus' day, a hard thing. Certainly hard in the Old Testament times. It's certainly hard today in our own country, in our own day. So two witnesses are to go out in sackcloth. And then he starts calling them by different names. He calls them two olive trees two lampstands that stand before the earth. Um, then he describes what they do. Well, let's talk about the olive trees and the two lampstands, first and foremost. Um, those come from Zechariah 4.14. So let's turn over to 4.14 in Zechariah. Uh, 
Well, let's uh, let's go a little further back. Well, just chapter 4, Zechariah, I'll start in verse 1. The angel who talked with me returned, woke me up as a man woken from his sleep. He asked me, what do you see? Zechariah says, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lights on it with seven channels to the lights. And all, also there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and one on its left. I asked the angel who talked to me, well, what are these, my Lord? He said, do you not know what these are? No. So he said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might or by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. And what are you, o, o mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you'll become level ground, but he will bring out the capstone to, shout, to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. But the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel had laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me. So Zerubbabel is coming back from exile, rebuilding God's temple in Jerusalem at this point. And then he talks about, the, uh, in verse 11, what are these two olive trees and on the right and left of the lampstand? And what are these two olive branches besides the two gold pipes, the golden oil? Do you not know what these are? And verse 14 says, These are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Two of the characters that show up in Zechariah and show up after, after the exile, Zerubbabel and Joshua. Not the Joshua back in the uh, you know, Jericho time. We're talking about a new Joshua here. Zerubbabel is the one that comes out as, as, the, as the, the temple. He rebuilds the temple. And Joshua, the, the, the king, you have a king and priest image here. Two olive trees are Zerubbabel and Joshua in Zechariah. So when Israelites come out of exile, they come back to Jerusalem, Zerubbabel and Joshua act as king and priest over God's people, rebuilding the temple and bringing back the covenant to the people of God. They're called two olive trees, two golden lampstands. And so that image comes to the forefront that Zerubbabel and Joshua are king and priest. And so let's make room for them. There's a lot of images going on here. Zerubbabel, I don't know if I'm spelling that right. I don't know where the B's go. Is that good? B, where's the B's go? Okay, man, thanks. So you got, you got priest and king here as the two olive trees and two lampstands. Old Testament images of two guys um, who represent the people of God to the world from Jerusalem, okay? What do they do? If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths. I'd love that if I could preach like that. <laughs> If I got going one Sunday and all of a sudden fire started spewing out, that would be cool. I'm just saying. It'd be cool for me. You sit in the front row. You don't have much to burn off the top, so we're good. We're good. <laughs> it would keep you awake, Harley? Yeah. It'd probably keep me awake, too. Bad breath. Fire comes from their mouths, devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These So fire from their mouths that's a reference to jeremiah 5 14 that our witnessing on behalf of the lord our speaking god's word to people is like fire from our mouth it's like fire from the mouth jeremiah 5 14 i'll just let you look that up later also Mm -hmm. Is that the fire? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Could be. I mean, fire Fire is always involved with representing God and speaking on behalf of God. Mm -hmm. But also Jeremiah 5.14 has a reference to when fire coming from the mouth of the prophets. So you have priest and king... Then you have, these men have the power to shut up the sky. Who did that in the Old Testament? So it did not rain? Shut up the sky, did not rain. Who did that? Elijah. Shut up the sky. Okay? You have Elijah. He's a prophet. All right? 
So Elijah shuts up the sky. So it did not rain during the time they were prophesying. And they have power to do, turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Who did that? Moses. So what you have is a laundry list of images from the Old Testament that he's trying to weave into what this whole thing is about. Two witnesses. Who are the two witnesses? Well, there's a lot of images that go along with it. The two witnesses are these two guys. And this priest and basically ruler and king over Israel all together. He's all three of these things. So you have these two guys. The actions of the two witnesses act like Elijah and Moses. The description of them act like the priest and king Zerubbabel and Joshua. The total picture is these are representatives of God's people on the face of the whole earth. They're two witnesses. This is who they are. This is what they do. And with, with all that, and you can go back to Exodus 7-12 through 12 to talk about Moses and, and the plagues. Uh, 1 Kings 17 and 18, Elijah and the stories of Elijah shutting up the sky and his, his uh, confrontation with the Baal worshippers. And their prophets. But what you have all together here is this image of prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest, and king. And when you boil that representation of God's people to the whole earth down, that just melts down into a funnel to one person eventually. Who is that one person? Jesus Christ. He's the prophet, priest, the high priest of all time, and the king prophet, priest, and king. And if something's true of Jesus, then it needs to be true of us as well. If he died, was buried, and raised from the dead, so will we die, be buried, and raised from the dead. If he's prophet, priest, and king, we are a priesthood of all believers. We are a royal priesthood, so we're kingly. We've talked about this in our sermons back in the summer, if we can remember back that far. If I could, if I could remember, we're prophets too. We speak on behalf of God. Who are the two witnesses? Well, they're Old Testament characters. It's Jesus. Eventually, this all boils down to Jesus, which when you take it to Jesus, it goes out to the church. The two witnesses, ultimately, what John's trying to get at here is through all of these images, the two witnesses are God's people, the church. We are called upon to witness. Like John was the specific prophet who was taking down this message Eat the scroll, prophesy. Eat it, take it in, prophesy. Now he's calling the whole church to be a part of this witnessing activity. So the whole church are the two witnesses. That's us. Now he goes about it a long way, doesn't he? (laughs) He takes us to a lot of Old Testament images, but all they are is images to, to sink into our minds and our heads that this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a combination, a mixture combination of Zerubbabel, Joshua, Elijah, Moses as representatives of God's people. And so Jesus culminates in that, and we come from Jesus, and we do the same. That's a lot to digest. Let me see if anything here helps us, because I had something written down here. I don't know if I want to use it or not, but we'll see. Page 233. Let's see if he gives us any idea what we need to read here. I'll just read this to you. Seen in this light, we should interpret the two witnesses as symbolic representation of the church. At least four observations support this assertion. First, we've seen that the two witnesses bear the characteristics of a king, Zerubbabel, priest, Joshua, and a prophet like Moses and Elijah. Throughout Revelation, Christians are portrayed as kings and priests and prophets. To illustrate, they rule as kings in Revelation 2, 26 and 27. They share Christ's kingly throne in chapter 3, verse 21. We wear crowns like kings in chapter 4, verse 4. We bear the priestly number 24 in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4. We carry bowls of incense of prayers like the priests do in chapter 5, verse 8. We approach the temple and altar like priests do in chapter 11, verse 1. John praises Christ as the one who has made us to be a kingdom and priest in Revelation 1, 6, Revelation 5, 10. Finally, Christians speak, <coughs> speak the word of God In chapter 6, verse 9, and they offer testimony in chapter 12, verse 11, thereby acting as the Lord's spokesman or prophets. That's just his first assertion. (laughs) 
Assertion number two, the two witnesses are called witnesses. Elsewhere in Revelation, John applies this title to Christians, and particularly to believers who were killed because of their testimony to Christ. Third, these witnesses have power to strike the earth with every kind of plague. As we have seen, this statement is linked to the two witnesses with the prophet Moses. At the same time, it may serve to identify that the witnesses are Christian saints. In Revelation 8.3, For it is the prayers of those saints that unleash the plagues of the first uh, six trumpets. And fourth, we see the two witnesses are persecuted and killed by the forces of evil during the period of John's prophecy until the consummation of God's kingdom. And so we wear sackcloth, the black garment of mourning. It suggests that the two witnesses should be understood as a symbol for Christians. He can go on and on. He's got a lot of information here. It's clear that what's true of Jesus is true of us. It has been true of the Old Testament past. We are God's representatives. We are his witnesses. And so it's probably too simplistic just to say two witnesses equals Christians and not go into all of this. But to understand all of this helps us understand why we are called the two witnesses. We are called to these functions, speaking on behalf of God, representing God, ruling with Christ over all creation. Prophet, priest, and king. Now to the bad part. <clears throat> Ready? When we do this, when we witness on behalf of Jesus Christ and to the whole world, it says in verse 7, now when they had finished their testimony, now let's stop right there. When they had finished, nothing is going to stop the activity of witnessing. God will now allow it to be stopped by any evil force any time. When they had finished, not if they finished or if some of them finished or if Some of them made it through. No, when they had finished, God will not allow witnessing to stop. That's that's his heart and soul, to to reach the nations, to bless the world. When they had finished their testimony, here we go. First time we hear about this, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively, I like the way he even tells us it's symbolic, figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. There's three images smacked together in a weave of what? For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth, the earth dwellers, okay, will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other's gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And when they went up to heaven in a cloud, they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming. Whew. Man, does this not exhaust your brain a little bit? I mean, it does mine. It's just a very exhausting task to get through these images. So let's walk through them again. When they had finished, the beast that comes out from the abyss, that we kind of learned about the abyss back in chapter 9, will attack, overpower, and kill. What this really says is you could die for witnessing for Christ. We've already seen that, have we not? The altar, the souls under the altar crying out for vengeance on their blood because they had died because of their testimony for Jesus. Many in John's day would understand this. Martyrs is what they would understand. And so they might die and when they do bad things happen their bodies lie in the great street of the great the street of the great city which is figuratively called sodom what's sodom in the old testament what's sodom wicked one of god's enemy cities so sodom is an enemy city and another city he another place he calls out is egypt who are they one of god's greatest enemies right he had to Redeem his people from them. And also, where also their Lord was crucified. Was he crucified in Egypt and Sodom? No. So what's he talking about? Where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. Oh. That's not good. 
what's been going on? Let's take, take a stroll back to the seven churches. I know what you're going through, church. I know these Jews who claim to be Jews, but they are a synagogue of Satan. A synagogue of Satan. It says that to Smyrna, it says that to Philadelphia. It was who put Jesus on the cross? Who got that going? The Jews. So even though God kind of chose the holy city, and this was where David would set up his throne, and God was pleased there, but so many times they rejected God to the point where the very blessing to the whole world was supposed to be a blessing to the whole world. They became the very, the very enemy of God. Except for one. Jesus and his friends. The new Jerusalem. The new Israel. The new people of God. The new Jews, if you will. But the city itself is in tandem with these. And all that image is trying to tell us is those are enemies of God. And the enemies of God will kill you Christians, just like they did. You know, Jesus said it. If anybody wants to follow me, he has to what? Take up his cross. What does that mean? You're, you might be a martyr. He even told Peter, you're probably going to die the way I did. Even worse. So suffering's involved with this. Dying might be involved with this. And in fact, disgraceful dying. Not only did they die, for three and a half days, men from every all the people, tribe languages, will gaze on the bodies and refuse them burial. How disrespectful to not give them a proper burial. Doesn't do it. And so he's trying to give us the image that people aren't going to care about you and your death. They're not going to care one bit. Because it says at the end of this, you tormented. <laughs> you torment. You've been that way with your non Christian friends. You're just like a torment to them. Whenever you come around, they're going, Oh, it's you again. I can't cuss now. I mean, that's how weak it is in America, you know, the persecution that goes on. And that happened to you? It happens, well, of course, it happens to me all the time. Oh, you're the pastor. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say that word in front of you? <laughs> yeah <laughs> and 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 they act differently or they're like waiting for you to ask him to come to church again you know do they see you coming and they're wanting to go the other way well that's a mild form in america compared to what these guys were doing these guys are witnessing to the point where they were calling people out and they can't, they don't like it so much that they are willing to kill them. This is happening in our world, just not in our particular part of the world, where people are dying because they're calling out the truth. So they refuse burial. The earth dwellers gloat over them, celebrate by sending gifts. They have their own Christmas <laughs> um, celebration. Oh. And, and the two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. And so... Kind of an ugly scene. And what the scene sets up is this. As you witness, you might die. And as you die, you might not be respected in your death. Expect it from the earth dwellers. They will gloat over you. They will party over you. You ever wondered like that? What happens if I die? Will they party you when I'm gone? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's all imagery. Understand, it's not literal fire coming out of their mouths, although I thought that was kind of fun to talk about, but <laughs> it's not literal fire coming out of their mouths. I mean, it's, it's, it's calling out their lifestyle. It's calling out their allegiances. It's calling out their morality. It's calling out everything about them. It's, it's hurting their very life that they think they love so much. Go back to the book of Acts. We talked about this in staff meeting here recently. Um, when, when, the, when the disciples are going out preaching, they affected economies. The slave girl that made the guys a lot of money, and she came to Jesus Christ, and they were ticked off. Why? Because we're not going to make money anymore. That really got into them. That's some real tormenting. See? 
Christian lifestyle will torment earth dwellers because they won't get what they want if they give up their will. And that's what the Christian lifestyle calls. You give up your will for the will of God. What they don't realize is that the will of God is so much greater than your own personal will and what you want. But it's torment to them because they think they got it all together. They think they got all the answers. They think, I can take care of myself. I can pull up myself from my own bootstraps. You know, I can do this. This is self-sufficiency. This is American rugged individualism. And Christianity comes along and says, you can work hard. That's a good thing to work hard. But to rely on yourself, you're in big trouble. Big trouble. And to call people away from that, it's torment to them. Because they think, they think you're calling them away from Something that they hold dear to themselves, you know. But I like my money. <laughs> but I like my wicked lifestyle. But I like sleeping around with five to ten different women a week. I like that. Don't, give, don't, don't take that away from me. You're going to call me away from that? I like it. Dare you to go into Hollywood and tell them to live the Christian lifestyle and see what they'd say. Would you give up Rodeo Drive? Would you give up your paycheck? Would you give up... For the sake of Christ, I mean, there's torment going on. It just may not be, you know, for some it may be actual whips and, you know, actual physical pain. But for most people, it's just, I don't want to give up my will. Yeah. I don't want to give up my will for God's will. Who, who wants to do that? Because it all revolves around power. Who's in control? If I give up my will, I lose power, I lose control. You see? And that's what the guys in Acts were, were dealing with. They had power when they had the these slave girl working for them. They had power because the economy was good. Power, economy, money, it all kind of rolls together. And, and, and we're going to see that throughout Revelation, that governments and, and power and money and all play into It's not that, that government's bad or money's bad, sexuality's bad. None of that's bad if it's used under the will of God. Most of it's not. Most of it's perverted and twisted out of shape. So torment, yeah. Torment, I mean, I remember talking to my friends in high school and they didn't like, they didn't like to, let's not talk about that. I had that conversation with a lot of friends and they just come back, I don't want to talk about that. Because it means giving up something they don't want to give up. So good question, good question. So they're celebrating the torment. We've got to get through this chapter here. Here's the cool thing. After the three and a half days, a breath of life, a breath of life from God entered them. What does that sound like? Sounds like resurrection to me. Hey, it takes me all the way back to the very first being, Adam, where God breathed into his nostrils and he became a living being. It reminds me of Ezekiel 37 with the dry bones and all the skeletons coming back together and the muscles and the sinews and, and the ligaments come together and the skin is formed and, and the dry bones come to life. It reminds me of Jesus Christ who was buried in, in, in the tomb and he was brought back to life. See, what's true of Jesus, you know, if it's true that we're going to be tor you know, tortured and possibly die for our faith like Jesus was put on the cross and he says, follow me, carry your cross, what's equally true is that God is going to raise us from the dead. This is the good part of Revelation. After three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. They stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Really? <laughs> really? Because You know why? The worst weapon in a tyrant's weapon, weaponry is what? Death. If I can threaten you with death, if you don't do this, I'll kill you. And the Christian says, <laughs> go right ahead. And throughout history, you see that. Christians who stand firm with boldness and say, go right ahead. Because I believe my God will raise me from the dead. And I don't have fear of that. Well, that's hard. I can't imagine that, you know, if that were to happen, that I would feel that bold and brave at that particular moment in time. But I would hope that I would hold on to that and say, you know what? Take it, because the worst weapon you can bring at me, God's already conquered. He's already conquered. Your weapons don't work. They don't work. And so they're terrified, of course, because what else can I do to you? I can't do anything else to you. So they saw him. They're terrified. 
They heard a loud voice from heaven say to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked at just images. Okay, again, images. Let's not go literal here. This is where we go way off track. Come up here, images, cloud. What's the cloud image? Ascension. And what's that? I've told you before what cloud indicates as an image. It's a big V word. Victory, but more than that. Big word. <laughs> Vindication. You remember, since we were surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us persevere. When Jesus was taken up in his ascension, it was God's vindication of him, placing him at the right hand of the Father. Cloud imagery throughout the Bible brings us this image of vindication that God has vindicated. When he says, come up here, and they went up to heaven in a cloud, it reminds us of Acts chapter 1. Jesus, the people were looking on as they, they went to, to this place called heaven. Now this time the enemies look on, not the disciples. This time God says the enemies will look and see that you are vindicated. That's big news. They kill you? Okay. I'll raise you from the dead. They'll look on in terror. Not only that, I'll vindicate you in front of their eyes so they can see your vindication that I have approved their death. And I have brought them back to life. So there's that image of death, burial, and resurrection right here. Then it says in verse 13, at that very hour there was a severe earthquake. A tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors who uh, were terrified, and of course, what they're going to do? They give glory to God in heaven. I would too. (laughs) I would too. Boy, there's a lot going on here. Um, Boy, let me get to where my notes are. (sighs) So much to cover. Um, At that very hour, There was a severe earthquake, a tenth of the city. This is something I had never seen before. And and then I was reading in this this commentary, uh, N.T. Wright's commentary, he had really pointed something out that one of those moments where your mind goes, you know, and you're thinking, wow, you know, I hadn't really seen that. One tenth of the city and 7,000 are opposites of something else in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God says, if ten people are good in Sodom and Gomorrah, I will save them. Flip it upside down. When judgment comes here from God, only a tenth collapse of a city. Images of a tenth collapsing, not... 90% because God says of the 90% wicked if 10% are not wicked I'll save them you know 10 remain the opposite happens let's go to Elijah he's part of this imagery what happened when Elijah confronts the prophets of Baal Jezebel um, Ahab Jezebel and Ahab yes And, and Got too much in my brain right now. So Ahab and Jezebel, he confronts them and he says, How many faithful are remnant at that time? How many faithful Israelite prophets are, are remnant that are faithful to God at that time? There were seven thousand. Seven thousand remain faithful. So here's what's happening. Very interesting. For Sodom. If 10 were faithful, I'll save them. For um, Elijah, after he got done doing all the things he got done doing, 7,000 were faithful. So basically the minority were faithful, right? Small number was faithful. When this image comes up, at the very hour, a severe earthquake comes and a tenth of the city collapses and 7,000 were killed in the earthquake. What you have is the opposite of faithful. In this case, the unfaithful collapse and the unfaithful are killed at the same rate, at the same number, which means the minority, minority falls under the judgment. Majority, well, what do they do? They give glory to God in heaven, the survivors. 
that that's one of the well those has to sink in. It had to sink into me for a few nights. I had to wrestle with this one. But what was very interesting is the opposite. This is all this equals one big word. We're going to talk about all in December. Hope. That the two witnesses are there for the purpose of bringing hope to the world. And indeed, there is hope in the Old Testament. The the minority is faithful. The minority is faithful. In this scenario, in this image, it's the minority that's unfaithful. Now, 7,000 could represent the complete number, 7. 7,000, so a bunch of people, complete bunch of people <laughs> that die. But it's the opposite of the results of Elijah and the opposite of the results of Sodom and Gomorrah. Which says there's hope. Which means that the church is indeed... I, throughout his political campaign but i disagree with his final phrase he used every time he had a speech that america is the hope of the world that's not true the church two witnesses are the hope of the world and that goes beyond america that goes into every country every city every place in this world that calls themselves christians we are the hope of the world this proves it out this shows it out in a very big demonstrative way if I have time, and I don't, <laughs> I was going, well, I might. Uh, I'll tell you what I did, and it's one of those, God forgive me for doing this, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it later. <clears throat> just, I just want you to catch that this whole image is about hope. That the two witnesses are bringing about an opposite result from the Old Testament, which was doom and gloom. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, burning sulfur. Jezebel and Ahab had their way with, with the Israelites, and, and not only a remnant, 7,000 remained faithful. That's very few number compared to all the Israelites, millions of them, okay? Lots of them. In this case, it's the opposite. Just wanted to, uh, we're going to move on. Seventh angel sounds his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of the, our Lord and of this Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. We're still in that throne room scene here, saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has, <coughs> excuse me, has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of earthquake, and a great hailstorm. So we've come to the end of what we know as the end of the age at the seventh trumpet. How do we know that this is the end of the age unequivocally, and not just a series of timelines that we need to parse out from here on out. Look at this song they sing. First off, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. That happens at the end. You know what that language is? Heaven, earth, coming together. The kingdom of our Lord has now become the kingdom uh, of the world, has become the kingdom of our Lord. He reigns forever and ever. The two have become one. After they get done worshiping, here's the song they sing. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty. Here's the key of one. The one, we sang it this morning. We ought to know this by heart. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The one who, and who was. What's missing? You don't have to say it. Is to come is not in your text. We could literally end the book of Revelation right here and be quite satisfied. And that they're wrong. I, I'm sorry, but I got I have the original language on that. I mean, I don't know why New King James would even put it there. I have no well, I know why they would put it there because they want to put together a timeline of seals and trumpets and bowls. They don't want this to end. They want it to keep going on. It's not there. The one who is and the one who was. But the one who is to come, his vision at the end of the seventh trumpet has already come. It's done. It's complete. It's over. In fact, the rest of the language backs it up. You have taken your and you've begun 
to reign in this new heaven and new earth scenario. The time has come for the judging of the dead. That's end of time language. Rewarding of your servants, the prophets. That's end of time discussion. Your saints, those who reverence your name, both great and small. And, of course, judging those who destroy the earth. And then God's temple in heaven was opened with this temple. was seen the Ark of the Covenant. That is exactly what they see out in the wilderness. After they come to the, the, the exodus, they come to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is the very presence of God, the very things of God, the Holy of Holies of God. We have access to that. It's complete. It's there. Yeah, you got it. Good explanation. I heard you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not a future thing according to john what he's seeing now is the end of all time the seventh trumpet but we still have chapters 12 13 14 15 16 17 all the way to chapter 22 to go because he's not quite complete in telling the, the entire story so at the end of, ch- of the seven seals we saw this language god will wipe away every tear from their eyes that happens in the the new earth in chapter 21 so we know at the end of the seven seals we're talking about the end of all things at the end of the seven trumpets we're looking at it from a different angle not from the redemptive will of god now we're looking at it from the call to repentance on the world and our part our participation in the interlude is to witness it may cost us our lives we may not get respect in the middle of that but we're called to witness anyway and god will redeem you he will raise you up from the dead if you get killed we have that hope, and we have the message of hope. And at the end of all things, we sing with the 24 elders, the one who was and the one who is. But the one who is to come has come, and everything has been made right again. Now that's the end of chapter 11. Let me quickly tell you what I did. I was a very bad preacher. How many years ago now? 10? No, well, when was 9-11? 2001? 2001? So 11 plus years ago, right after 9-11, I decided to preach a sermon about 9-11. And just to kind of show the ridiculousness of what people were going to do, and in fact they did, some preachers on TV did this, which drove me nuts, but I wanted to show the ridiculousness of it and move it into a a more positive spin. I said, look, 9-11 was predicted. Revelation chapter 11. So yeah, I started, you know bringing up some thoughts and it says there was a severe earthquake i'm sure new york felt like an earthquake at certain times and a tenth of the city collapsed well when you see the towers come down it looks like a tenth of manhattan collapsed and at that time during that week if you remember all the newspapers seven thousand people were killed and so we thought about seven thousand people so i say see revelation predicted this that it would happen and you should have seen the congregation in tuscal i, I, I asked god's forgiveness on that one long time ago but they all looked at me like oh, it does <laughs> it does well about 10 minutes into the sermon i said okay i'm pulling your foot i'm sorry i'm pulling your leg i don't mean to do that but i wanted to get your attention and i think i got it because the rest of chapter 11 is really what we ought to be doing in the midst of this tragedy of 9 11 and what's the rest of the chapter talking about the church as god's witness so we went on to talk about what it means to be a witness and how that really doesn't apply to 9-11 specifically. But you see how it can get sensational quickly? I can even make it up in my head if I want to. I just, no, I, sh- I shouldn't have. Bad, bad, <laughs> bad preacher. <laughs> bad pastor, bad pastor. All right. <laughs> Are we done with time? Time, times, and half a time. Okay, i got to let you go. If it, uh, here's the deal. How many of you need to go upstairs to get ready for choir, get ready for that kind of thing going on? Okay, I cannot keep you from doing that. I won't do that. But I don't want you to... Okay, I just won't, I just won't get into this yet. I'm going to have to wait. Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe at the beginning of next, uh, next time we meet, which is not next Sunday, by the way. Um... Well, there's a, there's this is a huge thing in here, but I can do it. I can do it next time. I can do it next time. We'll just do it next time. I don't want to. I don't want to. But wait, 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 wait. Whoa! I can't lose you yet. We don't meet next Sunday because our children's program, Christmas program, is next Sunday night at 6 p.m. Okay. So we're gonna meet December 9th, two weeks from today. 
we got to wait two weeks. We will go over chapter 12, which is the hinge of all the book of Revelation. It's the most important chapter in the whole book of Revelation. And it is awesome, and I'll get into what I wanted to get into tonight, but I didn't have time. Um, and then after December 9th, we're off for a month because of all the Christmas things that are going on. We'll come back January the 6th, first Sunday in January, and pick up on rapture theology that night, and then we'll move on to chapter 13. Okay? Sorry I couldn't get to the thing I wanted to get to tonight, but I just can't. Just can't do it. So have a great, great week.